paradigms and revolutions. So far we have been trying to solve the demarcation problem, which is a seemingly simple question. What makes science special? What is the difference between science and other things? We have already looked at and discarded four answers. The most recent answer was falsificationism, which claimed that science is special because it is falsifiable. The scientific method, according to falsificationism, moves from conjectures to refutations. Today we will examine the ideas of Thomas Kuhn, an American scientist and philosopher. Kuhn is very critical of falsificationism. His criticism boils down to two major claims. Scientific theories are structures as opposed to statements, and falsificationism is anachronistic. Let's start with the first criticism. All the solutions we have examined so far to the demarcation problem had one common assumption. Scientific theories are statements or collections of statements. For instance, consider Newtonian physics. This theory is Newton's three laws of motion and his law of universal gravitation. You can write these laws on a piece of paper as statements. It is that easy. When you do that, of course, you can stick those statements in an argument and make deductive and inductive inferences to and fro. But Kuhn thinks that this is overly simplistic. Scientific theories, according to him, aren't just statements. According to Kuhn, Scientific theories are parts of larger complex structures, which he calls paradigms. To understand what a paradigm is, we need to first understand how Kuhn thinks about the relationship between theory and observation. Unlike his predecessors, Kuhn is perfectly comfortable with theory dependence of observation. He thinks that the methods scientists use for testing a theory often presuppose parts of that tested theory. For instance, to test theories of particle physics, one must be able to recognize characteristic particle interactions in a bubble chamber, which requires one to take part of those theories for granted. That's why Kuhn thinks that a scientific theory is not just a bunch of statements that can be stuck into an argument form and confirmed or refuted in isolation. In Kuhn's opinion, what scientists are testing when they conduct an experiment or make an observation is instead a paradigm. A paradigm is a complex of theoretical and practical frameworks, mathematical and simulated models, instruments, methods of measurement and calibration, and standards of evidence, all of them directed at solving a set of puzzles. Newton's laws, for instance, is just a small part of such a complex structure. You can't test them just by plucking out one of those equations, stinking it into an inference form, and banging a few rocks into each other to see whether or not for every action there is an equal but opposite reaction. To see why, let's revisit Popper's example of the 1919 experiment. If you remember, Popper presents the logic of the experiment like this. If Einstein's theory is right, the apparent positions of the stars near the sun should shift slightly during the eclipse. If they don't, that means Einstein's theory is wrong. But Kuhn thinks that this is again overly simplistic. What is being tested isn't just a theory of relativity. Among other things, the experiment is also a test of telescopic calibration methods, atmospheric models, stellar charts, as well as the estimates of the sun's mass and the nature of the interstellar space. I'm probably still oversimplifying. There are many methods and assumptions working together here, and Einstein's theory of relativity is only one of those. 
Had the experiment yielded a different result than what Einstein had predicted, the result could have been blamed on any of these methods and assumptions. The theory as a series of mathematical equations didn't have to be abandoned. The second charge Kuhn raises against falsificationism is that it is anachronistic. To understand this charge, we need to first understand how Kuhn sees science as a practice embedded in history. According to Kuhn, there are two kinds of scientific activity, normal and revolutionary, which he also calls extraordinary. Normal science, as the name suggests, is just normal. It is the most common form of scientific activity. It is also somewhat dogmatic, somewhat boring, ideologically unifying. What is more, normal science focuses on solving familiar puzzles with no methods. Normal science, Kuhn says, is a characteristic type of puzzle-solving activity premised on a shared paradigm. Kuhn thinks that normal science is somewhat dogmatic because in this phase, scientists don't question the fundamentals of their shared paradigm. I still remember being a physics major decades ago and asking my electricity and magnetism professor a bunch of questions implying that maybe the photon energy equation is inaccurate because it ignores amplitude. My professor couldn't answer my questions. He didn't know why the equation didn't take amplitude into account. But this didn't bother him at all. He was sure that there must be an explanation he is missing. What bothered him was instead me wasting his time with pointless questions. He told me bluntly, I don't have time for this. Go talk to a philosopher. And I did. And here we are. By the way, there is nothing wrong with the equation. I was wrong. Kuhn characterizes normal science also as somewhat boring. It is routine and repetitious. It doesn't involve earth-shattering discoveries or experiments. When you read Galileo's notebooks, for instance, most of them are painstaking, number-crunching, or tediously recording the observations he made of a dim, ordinary star. One page, perhaps out of 10,000, contains something exciting. Of course, that's Galileo, the father of modern science. If you read the writings of an ordinary scientist, it would be nearly impossible to stay awake because there is never anything exciting, except for the occasional calculation error or logical blunder. Normal science is also unifying. Scientists in this phase unite behind one common paradigm and try to solve its puzzles cooperatively. Dissent is hushed up and retreats to the fringe. Finally, normal science engages well-understood problems with well-established tools. Your physician, for instance, is an ideal normal scientist. A medical doctor almost never tries heterodoxic diagnostic ideas or therapies. Contrary to what daytime medical dramas may, might suggest, Medical doctors don't steer away from the well-tested consensus, except when things are truly desperate. Revolutionary science, in contrast, is exceedingly rare. It is also viciously critical in its attitude, dramatic in its execution, and divisive in its effect on the scientific community. Revolutionary science encourages the discovery of new puzzles and methods. In the revolutionary phase, scientists routinely criticize the shared assumptions and accepted methods. They ask what-if type of questions. What if the Earth is much older than we thought? What if the Sun is just a star? What if disease is caused by invisible organisms? What if light is just the same thing as electricity and magnetism? What if space can be expanded and compacted? What if time can slow down? And accelerate? What if the universe we know is one of infinitely many? Revolutionary science also includes ambitious attempts to falsify accepted theories. 
this critical and dramatic environment leads to division and tension within the scientific community. Some come forward in defense of the old paradigm. Some call for its abandonment and propose to replace it with a radical new idea. Finally, revolutionary science leads to a flurry of activity aimed to discover brand new ways of doing science. You might have caught me calling normal and revolutionary science phases of science. According to Kuhn, these phases follow each other. Indeed, according to Kuhn, the history of science isn't a smooth curve. Science progresses by following a cyclical path, forever oscillating between normal and revolutionary science. In normal science, things are nice and tidy. Commonly accepted methods work reasonably well. Then a crisis mounts. Anomalies, odd things the current paradigm cannot explain, emerge and accumulate. Commonly accepted methods fail to deal with these anomalies and often produce absurd results indicating that something is wrong with the paradigm. This overwhelming sense that something is wrong encourages some scientists to look for a replacement for the old paradigm. These new candidates promise to address the anomalies. When a serious contender emerges, the situation turns into an all-out science war, where the old guard try to defend the existing paradigm and the new wave try to demolish it. Finally, one of the revolutionary groups wins. The dust settles, things go back to nice and tidy. The new but commonly accepted methods work reasonably well. Let's look at the Copernican Revolution to see how this process is supposed to happen. In the beginning, we have the geocentric model of the universe. Everything is nice and tidy. The earth is in the center, but corrupted by the fall of Adam and Eve. Everything in the heavens is perfect spheres orbiting Earth in eternally perfect circles, testifying to the glory and perfection of God Almighty. But slowly and surely, a crisis emerges. Odd things pop up. Galileo, for example, observes that the moon has mountains. It is not a perfect sphere. Common people all over the world see comets and noahs emerging and disappearing, suggesting that perhaps not everything is perfect and eternal up there. And the planets keep zigzagging, which makes it impossible to even pretend that their orbits are circular. The resulting system is perhaps beautiful in its own right, but it isn't nice and tidy. The crisis encourages revolutionaries. Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish priest and scientist, comes up with the heretical idea that the Earth is not in the center. It's a planet. Earth is just a planet of the sun, he says. Can you believe that? Then Galileo Galilei draws pictures of the mountains of the moon, documents the phases and transitions of Venus, and discovers the rings of Saturn and the major moons of Jupiter. The Earth moves, and the Sun is just a star, he insists. And the scientific community of his day lock him up for his heresy. Inspired by the revolutionary spirit of his time, the French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes declares that everything we claim to know should be re-examined. We can doubt even the existence of God himself. Can you believe this guy? And Johannes Kepler, perhaps the worst of all, demonstrates that a simple equation can represent the elliptic orbits of planets and comets. The Pope, who had originally saw Copernicus as an amusing lunatic, now bans all cosmology books, fearing that if the people realize that they have been lied to by the clergy for a thousand years, they will revolt and destroy the church. Of course, above all, there is Newton, who completes the revolution by demonstrating that almost everything we see in the sky can be explained by four simple equations. 
The old guard die out or bitterly surrender. Europe is swept by the wave of revolutions the Catholic clergy had feared, and the church is forced to give up much of its power. Never again would it be able to stand against secular science. Once more, everything is nice and tidy. The world makes sense. Here's another example of how anomalies arise and amount to crises and revolutions. You might remember the discovery of Neptune. Scientists noticed that the orbit of Uranus is odd. It was traveling faster than it was predicted by Newtonian equations. They thought that perhaps an unseen planet is tugging on Uranus. They calculated the orbit of that unseen planet using Newtonian physics and looked for that planet where it should be. There it was, Neptune, eighth planet. A similar thing happened with Mercury, but it didn't end so well for Newtonian physics. Mercury is a weird planet in the sense that its orbit rotates around the sun, not just the planet itself, but the whole orbit turns over time. This phenomenon is called precession of Mercury's perihelion. Other planets don't do that. Only Mercury does that. This is not what Newtonian physics predicts it should do. Scientists of the 19th century thought, aha, uh -huh, this is just like that one time when we discovered Neptune. Maybe there is a planet near the sun which is messing with Mercury's orbit and making it turn. They did some calculations using Newton's equations, and the result was very odd. This supposed planet almost grazed the sun's atmosphere. Still, they gave, gave it a name, Vulcan, after the Roman god of fire. Poetic. As poetic as it might be, finding this new planet proved difficult. For more than a hundred years, scientists looked for Vulcan and couldn't see it. They made excuses, arguing that perhaps the planet is so close to the sun that it blends in its glare. What they didn't realize is that Vulcan doesn't exist. We learned the correct explanation for the precession of Mercury's perihelion only when Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity. Remember, earlier I said massive objects like the Sun bend the space around them. The reason why Mercury's, Mercury's orbit appears to turn around the Sun is that the Sun's own rotation tugs on the space around the Sun and kind of swirls it, just like a vortex in a bathtub. Mercury's orbit gets caught in that spiral vertex and it turns. The procession of the perihelion of Mercury was the last battle between the old guard Newtonians and the revolutionary relativists. Newtonians lost and gave up. Earlier I said that Kuhn accuses falsificationism of being historically inaccurate. That's what we mean by anachronism. Now let's examine that charge. Kuhn argues that falsificationism focuses on the relatively rare revolutionary phase of the history of science and ignores the normal phase completely. On page 13 of The Logic of Discovery or Psychology of Research, Thomas Kuhn says, Karl Popper has characterized the entire scientific enterprise in terms that apply only to its occasional revolutionary parts. His emphasis is natural and common. The exploits of a Copernicus or Einstein make better reading than those of a Brahe or Lorentz. Although the language is superficially polite here, Kuhn is accusing Popper of doing lousy scholarship. The accusation is that Popper is a sensationalist who cherry-picks the rare dramatic moments of science and pretends them to be representative of science as a whole. We will come back to this accusation a bit later. Kuhn also offers a solution to the demarcation problem. Remember, the demarcation problem is a simple question. What makes science special? 
whose solution has to do with the boring normal part of science, a characteristic type of puzzle solving activity premised on a shared paradigm. A paradigm, remember, is a complex of theoretical and practical frameworks, mathematical and simulated models, instruments, methods of measurement and calibration, and standards of evidence, all directed at solving a set of puzzles. But that doesn't answer the question directly. What exactly is the thing that makes science special? Kuhn says if a practice can be described as a normal science, that is, puzzle solving premised on a shared paradigm, then it is scientific. If a belief, opinion, or theory is part of that practice, again, that belief, opinion, or theory is scientific. Let's see now how his solution works in practice. Kuhn thinks that astronomy is scientific. Astronomy is a scientific discipline because it's a puzzle-solving activity premised on a shared paradigm. In astronomy, there are some shared theoretical and practical frameworks, such as the theories of optics, differential calculus, and Newtonian physics. They also use a bunch of shared methods and standards such as stellar databases, testable conjectures, telescopic observations, spectral and parallax measurements, so on and so forth. These shared assumptions and methods and standards form a shared paradigm that we call modern astronomy. But this paradigm exists for a reason. It exists to solve a bunch of puzzles, such as why is Uranus orbiting faster than it should? Why is Mercury's orbit turning? Are, are there life-sustaining planets outside the solar system? And such. In contrast, Kuhn thinks that astrology is not scientific. For Kuhn, astrology is not a scientific discipline because although it has a shared paradigm, it doesn't have puzzles to solve. True, practitioners of astrology have shared assumptions such as the idea that planets and stars influence our behavior and that their positions and apparent movements at the time of our births are particularly influential on our characters. They also have methods and standards such as star charts called horoscopes which indicate the positions and movements of the planets and constellations and personality profiles associated with certain times of birth. So in astrology, there is a shared paradigm too. However, Kuhn claims that astrologers have no puzzles to solve. On page 16, he says, though astrologers had rules to apply, they had no puzzles to solve, and therefore no science to practice. Kuhn says this because he thinks that there is nothing to do if a horoscope fails to represent reality accurately or a personality profile doesn't fit. The astrologers simply shrug their shoulders and move on. Kuhn's vision of science as paradigms and revolutions is attractive, in some respects at least. It, for one thing, doesn't try to oversimplify. If anything, he is a bit heavy on complexity. He shows lots of historical awareness. He routinely brings in dozens of examples to hammer in a point. Just reading a single book by him would be enlightening as a course in the history of science. In this juncture, I strongly recommend his book, The Copernican Revolution, to those who have a further interest in the subject. What's more, his theory is extremely versatile. Whereas inductivist and falsifications focus solely on the logical structure of science, Kuhn is interested in the anthropology, psychology, and sociology of science just as much as its logic. In part because of his diverse interests, Kuhn describes the everyday practice of science better than perhaps his predecessors. But there are also problems. First, his criticism of Popper is a bit overly harsh and perhaps misses Popper's point entirely. 
Kuhn accuses Popper of cherry-picking the revolutionary bits of the history of science by focusing on the revolutionary episodes of science. To see why Popper is doing so isn't necessarily a mistake, consider the following hypothetical. You are taking an art history class. Which one would be a better paper topic? A. History of the 19th century painting, which focuses on the majority, who are run-of-the-mill scientists of unremarkable skill and vision, who mostly copied what they learned with little creativity and improvement. Or B, the history of the same period, as practiced by revolutionary artists like Cezanne, Monet, Van Gogh, and so on and so forth. I don't think either option is intrinsic to good or bad. Which one is better depends on what you are trying to learn. If your objective is to get a grasp of art as a social phenomenon, A might be the better choice. If your objective is to understand what makes 19th century painting so remarkable, so beautiful, so special, B is perhaps the way to go. Similarly, Kuhn's interests in science are largely sociological. He wants to understand how the ordinary scientist thinks and behaves. Normal science is the natural habitat of ordinary scientists, so he focuses on normal science. Popper, on the other hand, is interested in what makes science so remarkable, so successful, so amazing, so special. That's probably why Popper ignores the scientific equivalent of paper pushers and looks at how the extraordinary people like Galileo, Newton, Darwin, and Einstein think and behave at the extraordinary moments of science. It is perhaps the thoughts and the behavior of scientific geniuses that make science special. A second problem with Kuhn is how vague he is, especially when it comes to fundamental concepts. Keywords such as paradigm, puzzle solving, and anomaly are never clearly defined. Indeed, he often seems to shift between different meanings of the same term, which makes comprehension difficult. If you notice, for instance, none of the definitions I provided exist in the text. In a way, I presented a sock puppet version of Kuhn because God only knows what real Kuhn thinks. In part because of this lack of clarity, his solution to the demarcation problem is unworkable. The problem here isn't that we can't draw a sharp line between science and other things. He acknowledges that on page 14, and I have sympathy for that. The world is a messy place, clear lines don't fit reality very well. The problem is, by his logic, we can't draw any line between science and other things, sharp or fuzzy. Take for instance what he says about why astrology is not a science. He says astrologers have a paradigm, but they have no puzzle. Is that true? Don't they have any puzzles to solve? Here's a puzzle for any budding astrologers in my audience. The procession of the equinoxes. What is that? We will get to that in a minute. Astrologers divide the sky into 12 equal regions occupied by 12 classical constellations. Your astrological sign is determined by which constellation the sun would be facing or was facing at the time of your birth. That's, of course, relative to Earth. Here's how you can visualize that. I was born in May, so I should be Aries, because in May, the sun relative to Earth was facing the constellation Aries. Hold on a minute, though. That's not correct. Aries is not May. It is between March 20th to April 20th. What's going on? Here's what's going on. The Earth is tilted, as you know. But that tilt isn't stable. It keeps changing. It's changing very slowly over thousands of years. So the positions of the constellations also shift gradually over thousands of years. 
In fact, the positions of the 12 constellations have shifted significantly in the 3,000 years since they were first identified by Babylonians. When we take that shift into account, we get new corrected dates for each astrological sign. Here are these corrected dates versus the traditional dates used by astrologers. That of course poses a huge puzzle for astrologers. In their horoscopes, they have been using the traditional, therefore obsolete dates for millennia and using the same personality profiles. How can those horoscopes and their profiles consistently describe human character and behavior while the constellations underpinning them changed over time? Of course, most astrologers have no interest in such puzzles because they are too busy cutting people into buying their ancient scam. But if they were interested to solve it, they have a puzzle out there. So, even Kuhn doesn't apply his solution correctly. By his logic, he should identify astrology as a science. Recap. We have been still searching for a solution to the demarcation problem. What makes science special? In this lecture, we looked at a fifth answer to that question. Kuhn's idea that science is a form of puzzle solving. Kuhn thinks that if a practice can be described as a normal science, that is to say, puzzle solving premised on a shared paradigm, it is scientific. If a belief, opinion, or theory is part of that practice, it is scientific. Kuhn's views are interesting, but ultimately don't seem to provide a solution to the demarcation problem. Of course, that's exactly what Farrowin said. Once more, we have tried and failed to find a satisfactory solution to the demarcation problem. But as you can guess, we won't, we won't give up just yet. We will try one more time with another brilliant philosopher of science, Imre Lakatosh. This brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.